Good afternoon, everyone. You're probably wondering what does it mean when I speak about the Herodian mind. Now, we're living in very, very strange times. And the times we are living in not only affect us, but affect the entire world. And before they killed Tyndall, he had one last prayer. And he said, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And so before I start this lecture, not that I want to be in Tyndall's character, <laughs> in shoes, but before I start this lecture, I also would like to pray and ask the Lord for a special favor. So if you will allow me. Heavenly Father, Throughout the ages, you have wanted the eyes of those that do not see to be opened. And today I want to pray that you will open the eyes of your church. And that you will not only open the eyes of your church, but that you will open the eyes of the whole world, so that the gathering may commence. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that might seem like a somewhat strange preamble to some, but in today's world and in today's climate of cooperation and ecumenism, it is not politically correct to speak about the issues pertaining to the three angels' messages. And this is causing quite some consternation. There are even some who believe that prophecy being conditional, the issues regarding the Antichrist and what the Reformers believed regarding the papal system, that that doesn't apply because it could be a conditional prophecy and it might never happen. Perhaps it only has an eschatological future, but not for the here and now. So today we can be in ecumenical sessions as whatever, guests or as observers. But it doesn't really pertain to us. There are some to say that say we should not preach on the issue of the Antichrist and the three angels' messages in the way that we do because it is offensive. We should have other ways of preaching this issue. And some will say it's not part of our 28 fundamental beliefs. And if you study them carefully, it doesn't say so. It says that the reformers believe that the papal system was antichrist. But it doesn't pertinently say we still believe it. Although it is there, of course, in the spirit of prophecy. But if you say that the spirit of prophecy cannot be used in that sense, well, then you don't really have a leg to stand on and it opens the floodgates and anything can come into the church. And so today, when you start speaking on these issues and you link history and you link current events to the prophecies, they have a nice catchphrase for it, and it's called conspiracy theories. <laughs> have you heard that? Yes. yes, it's called conspiracy theories. And some will warn and say, that we shouldn't be associated in any way with these conspiracy theories. Now, I don't deny the fact that there are conspiracy theories out there. But I do deny the fact that a clear exegesis of the Bible linked to current events is not conspiracy, but fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. And so, this is quite a problem to me. And when some of our leading men write that we should not look at current events and watch the news to see what is happening because then we are inclined towards these conspiracy theories and please do not support anyone that does this kind of thing. Or when even leaders start discussing this issue and saying that those who propagate any such ideas should really not be tolerated then uh, it is time to take a deeper look 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak about the issue first in the philosophical sense and see where it leads. And then, hopefully, we can come to some kind of conclusion as to where we are in the stream of time and where it fits into prophecy. If some would want to call this conspiracy, they may. If some of them would rather see it as a confederacy, then they may too. I see it as a fulfillment of prophecy, and I see it as a fulfillment of the Word of God, and I can see that we are heading towards the very final events on this planet. Eight testimonies. There is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the school of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict for the great, of the great controversy. That's a commission. And that is a commission which is in direct contradiction to the sentiments that I have just spoken about. We have an injunction, if we are watchmen on the walls of Zion, to watch the events of history and to fit them into prophetic pictures or else we could just miss the bus. I wouldn't like anyone to miss the bus and particularly my church. I fear for my church when they marginalize the third angel's message and the second angel's message. Let us go back in history. This is the god Marduk, and he had a sign which was the sign of Anu. He also has a sword, and he has a trident, two tridents in fact here, which are in actual fact thunderbolts. You will find this deity as you go through the various cultures in many, many forms. You will find the deities throwing their thunderbolts from the Zeus of the Greeks all the way through the, the cultures of the world. Now, many of these legends have their origin in some reality. And the origin goes back all the way to the very beginning. You see, the god Marduk was the son of Anu. And he had the commission, he received the commission to rule over evil. So the earth and the creation and everything that was here was evil. And he received authority from God to rule over the darkness and the evil. And his sign is embroidered here on the hem of his coat and upon his arm. He has the mark of authority to rule over the powers of evil. Now, if you go back into history, some will claim that this is actually a reference all the way back to the beginning and the story of Cain and Abel. Here is the god Shamash, and here he has the symbol of Anu, this eight-pointed star, which was two crosses, as it were. The wavy line represents the female, and the straight lines represents the male principle, because these deities were always in consort. They were male, and they were female. Now, Ishtar was the queen of the night, as she is called in the British Museum, and she also had a star, and as you can see, it is the same symbol. It is the sign of Anu. And she also ruled the night. And you find her in all the different cultures. 
When you go to Egypt, it will be Isis and Horus, the son, and Osiris, the father, who then became reborn as the son. So these were the deities that ruled over evil and had the authority from the creator God to rule over the children of evil. And so they have probably got their origin in a greater reality. Now when you look at the laws and the structures that they evolved to rule over people, then we find some interesting facts here. This is one of the earliest laws known, the Code of Hammurabi. It is well preserved, the Babylonian law code, and it dates back to 1772 BC. It's one of the oldest deciphered writings of significant length in the world. It's the sixth Babylonian king, Amurabi, enacted the code in partial copies exist on a human-sized stone stele in various clay tablets. Now the code consists of 282 laws with scaled punishments, adjusting an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as graded depending on social status, slave versus free man. Nearly one half of the code deals with matters of contract, establishing, for example, the wages to be paid to an ox driver or a surgeon. So these are laws of government. Do they remind you of laws today? Do we have laws governing all these things coming into existence in the world all over? Big statute books of law. So they dealt with many, many things. So they dealt with economic measures. They dealt with labor questions. They dealt with uh, penal punishments for various crimes. Other provisions set the terms of a transaction establishing the liability of a builder for a house that collapses. Do we have laws like that today? For example, or property that is damaged while left in the care of another. Do we have laws like that today? A third of the code addresses issues concerning household and family relationships such as inheritance, divorce, paternity, sexual behavior. Do we have laws like that today? Only one provision appears to impose obligations on an official. This provision establishes that a judge who reaches an incorrect decision is to be fined and removed from the bench permanently. A handful of provisions address issues related to military service. And then it is signed with the following. On this, on this stella it says, Anu and Bel called by, my, called by name me Hammurabi the exalted prince who feared Maduk, the chief god of to bring about the rule in the land. So they had the power to rule. They had their capacity to rule from the highest authority, who they said was God. God gave them the power to rule. Now, if we go to our Bible commentary, we'll see that the Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi was one of the oldest collections of laws, but there were others as well that were older than that. It was written in Sumerian, this one, and then uh, it was discovered near Baghdad, and then the Code of King Balama of Eshuna, who ruled some 300 years before Hammurabi was found, and then another law was found, that of Urnamu, and it's fascinating that the further you go back in history, the more similarity there is between God's law and the laws of the nation. So as people moved away further and further from allegiance to God's law, the laws became more and more and more intrusive and more complex. But these people who had these laws ruled with an iron fist over the people of the earth, authorized by God. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, And thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So, let's go back to the earliest times. Here was a power in heaven, Lucifer, 
and he wanted to be in charge. He wanted to sit in the seat that God occupied. Har, mountain, that means a kingdom, the parallel in the Bible. So he wanted to sit upon the kingdom of God, as it were, and he wanted to be part of this congregation. So by implication, an assembly, the congregation, a place of meeting or a signal, appointed place, assembly, feast, season, solemn synagogue. He wanted to rule over the people. He wanted to have rulership. Well, we know what happened to him. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and they were cast out. And then he came down to this earth, and there was Adam and Eve. And then he worked on their minds, and he deceived them, and he became the ruler of this planet. But God had a way out, and God devised the plan of salvation. And in Genesis chapter 3, 15, we read, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In James 4, verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So we have two groups. We have the world and we have God's people. Do God's people have a law? Yes, God's people have a law. And it's the law, as we find it in the Bible, which defines character, the Ten Commandments. And... Is there a war between good and evil? Yes, it's called enmity between thee and the woman, God's people, those who belong to God's church, the woman. So they are subject to a law. They have a covenant with God. But they are not taken out of this world. They are part of this world. And they are living in a world that is ruled not everywhere or hardly any place by God's people. Is that right? So the others are ruling. With what authority are they ruling? And how are they ruling? We'll have to look into that issue. But the fact of the matter is that what the world does and how the world thinks should be opposite to what God's people do and think. Now many of the laws of the land are of course the same as those that God's people would keep. For example, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and all of these. And as long as the law doesn't interfere with God's law, God says you must obey the public authorities. So you must be part of the system without becoming engrossed in the system. Now we read that this declaration, I will put enmity, was not only a declaration of war, but it was the first gospel preached, the first gospel sermon ever preached to fallen man. This promise was the star of hope, illuminating the dark and dismal future of the race. Adam gladly received the welcome assurance of deliverance and diligently instructed his children in the way of the Lord. So here was a chance, a way out. Struct your children. The promise was presented in close connection with the altar of the sacrificial offering. You cannot separate the two. Salvation always lies outside of ourselves. It is in Christ. The altar and the promise stand side by side, and one casts clear beams of light upon the other, showing that the justice of an offended God could be appeased only by the death of his beloved Son. So if you are in Christ, you are linked to the sacrifice. In the case of Cain and Abel, we have a type of two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. And this type 
is worthy of close study. So this is strike two. We have to study history. We have to study the dealings of God with the nations. We have to study the providences of God in current times and apply them to what God has promised would happen. That's prophecy. And we are to study these two archetypes. It's part of our, our job description. Cain represents those who carry out the principles and works of Satan. By worshipping God in a way of their own choosing. It doesn't say they don't worship God. It says they worship God in a way of their own choosing. This is very important. So you're going to have godly people or apparent godly people out there but they are worshipping God in a way of their own choosing and not in a way that God said he should be worshipped. And we need to be very clear about this distinction. Like the leader whom they follow, they are willing to render partial obedience, but not entire submission to God. The Cain class of worshippers includes by far the largest number. So, Anywhere you go, God's people will be outnumbered. Is that a fact? And so we are outnumbered, and yet we are not taken out of the world. We are in the world, but shouldn't be part of the world. For every false religion that has been invented has been based on the Cain principle. Every false religion that has ever been invented is based on the Cain religion. Now, just help me here. To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. Should it be difficult to determine which religion is based on the Cain principle and which religion is based on the God principle? Don't we have a guide whereby to determine this? Now, don't get me wrong. If the vast majority of mankind belongs to the worship of the Cain principle, does that mean we isolate ourselves from this group and have nothing to do with them? Well, then I would still be part of the Cain principle, wouldn't I? Because I came out of the world. And so would most of you be part of the Cain principle. Isn't that correct? So we don't want to be part of the Cain principle. And God, in his mercy, makes a way of escape for everyone who's part of the Cain principle. So you never write them off. But you may never ever forget whose principle you fall under. Okay, so every false religion that has been invented has been based on the Cain principle that man can depend upon his own merits and righteousness for salvation. Every false religion. Genesis chapter 4 verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, because his sacrifice wasn't accepted. He brought the fruits of his labor, and said, there it is. Now, had God instructed them on the plan of salvation? Absolutely. The very clothes they're wearing, skins, in this picture tells you that God instructed them. The Lamb had already pointed ahead to the coming of the Lamb of God. And they must have been instructed that without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sins, pointing to the Lamb of God. So here, Cain and Abel are bringing their various offerings, the one according to the dictates of God, the other one according to his own dictates. And when it happened that he wasn't accepted, Cain's, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now there are some, I'm not too averse to the idea, that think, well, maybe Cain even justified his act 
maybe they thought that uh, one of them would be a blood sacrifice. Maybe he slew him, even thinking, well, if God, if you want a blood sacrifice, why take a lamb? Why not give you the real thing? So it doesn't seem as though he had great repentance. He had sorrow for what he had lost, but not sorrow for what he had done. Is that correct? I'm not saying it was so. It was a, probably a fit of rage, but in some way he must have justified it. And God came to him and said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, and hast opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her a strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be on the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Is there any sorrow in that? No, he has a problem with the punishment. He doesn't necessarily have a problem with what he did. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. I'm now an outcast. What am I going to do? Now God in his foresight sees that the children of disobedience are going to eventually be far more than the children of obedience. Isn't that right? And somebody has to rule. And if he puts the minority in charge of the majority, eventually all the ables that are there will be slain. Is that a possibility? And so God has to find a solution. Who's going to rule over the children of evil? Who's going to do it? They will slay me. And so God makes a covenant with Cain. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now there's been a lot of speculation as to what the mark of Cain is, but we only have to look at the words to get an idea as to what the mark of Cain is. The mark, the word, is interesting because it's the Hebrew oath. If you would take it straight into the English, it would be oath. But of course, we're not going to do that lest we get theologically slaughtered. We'll just say that the Hebrew is oath, which means a signal as a flag, a beacon, a monument, a prodigy, an evidence, a mark, a sign, a token. Now, if we go to Exodus 31, 13, where we're talking about the children of God, it says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign, and the word there is oath. Same word. Exactly the same word. Between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Two signs. One the mark of Cain. The other one the mark of God's people. The mark of God's people points to the Sabbath. The Sabbath tells you where you come from, and the Sabbath tells you in Deuteronomy that you are redeemed. You have been bought with a price. So here are God's people. They have the oath of God. They are keeping the commandments of God. They are in the minority. When Cain sinned, one of Adam's rebellious daughters sided with him. I'm speculating, of course, and decided that she was more affiliated to him than to the others and went with him. If he goes, I go. He must have gotten a wife somewhere, right? And so the family split up doesn't say so in the Bible, but it's a logical deduction. And those that fell under the rule of Cain received the mark of Cain, and those that fell under the rule of God had a simple sign of obedience to God's commandments right from the very beginning. And I think that that is 
a logical conclusion. So the mark is not some physical stamp or sign that he had. It is a mark of authority. Because the Sabbath is a sign of authority, therefore the mark of Cain must be a sign of authority. This one acknowledging the authority of God, and this one acknowledging no higher authority than himself. So it's two authorities. The one falls subject to God, the other one falls subject to the mark of Cain. So they will set the authority, they will set the tone. And vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Don't mess with Cain. If Cain catches you in a transgression against him, he'll punish you seven times. He has the authority. Don't mess with him. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So now the children of disobedience start growing. And I'm sure there were other defectors along the line. And Cain's family grew much faster than that of the Lord's people. Adam and Eve tried their best to stem the tide. So this firstborn of Cain, his name was Enoch, not to be confused with the other Enoch, because this one didn't walk with God. This one started to build cities. And unto Enoch was born Erad, and Erad began Mewayal, and Mewayal, Methusael, and Methusael beget Lamech. And the rot sets in. And Lamech took unto him two wives. So now we have apostasy increasing. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. And then it gets even worse. Verse 23, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man. Here's another murderer in the line of Cain. But he is an inheritor of the authority because this is going down the sons of Cain. To my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So the rules will get tougher, but not only that. I was interested in this seventy and sevenfold, and I looked for a translation because it's hard to determine what it is. I like the Geneva Bible, and as you know, that is the old Bible, so the spelling looks funny. But uh, if Cain shall be, in the old days that was one word, <laughs> if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy times sevenfold, says the Geneva Bible. I like that. 70 times 7. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. It rings a bell somewhere? Oh. What happened at the end of the 70 times 7 that you find in the book of Daniel? Probation closed for the Jews as a nation. Not as individuals, but as a nation. So if Cain was to have a sevenfold structure, then Lamech would have a 70 times 7 structure, but it would only last until God said, probation for you is closed. Does that make sense? I'm speculating. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, does seem that these words are not just arbitrary. Now, Let's jump straight into the esoteric world and let me just make plain again that my sources will be the very best sources for those who want to make them obscure. I will quote from the highest occult sources in the world and I will quote from encyclicals directly from the Vatican so that anybody who wishes to say that these are not authoritative had better 
check them out and see whether it is so. Morals and dogma, Albert Pike. You know what's fascinating? Is that the esoteric world doesn't deny the Bible. It just twists the Bible. It doesn't deny the chronology of the Bible. The evolutionists deny the chronology of the Bible. The esoteric world knows that the Bible is true. That's fascinating. Now, Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike, he says the following, Enoch. His name signified in the Hebrew, initiate or initiator. So he's the initiate of the initiator. The legend of the columns of granite and brass or bronze erected by him is probably symbolical. He's the one who built the city, remember? That of bronze which survived the flood is supposed to symbolize the mysteries of which masonry is the legitimate successor. So irrespective of the stuff in between those two points there, we can say, according to the occult world, Enoch is the initiate and the initiator, and Freemasonry is the inheritor of whatever it is that was initiated. Is that correct? Is that what he's saying? Good. So, Masonry traces its origin back to Enoch. High Masonry. From the earliest times, the custodian or masonry is the legitimate successor of the Enoch principle. From the earliest times, the custodian and depository of the great philosophical and religious truths unknown to the world at large. Unknown to the world at large. And handed down from age to age by an unbroken current of tradition. Uh, do we have a religious organization that uh, prides itself on its tradition? embodied in symbols, emblems, and allegories. So they trace themselves back from Enoch, and then they say Enoch walked with God and all these marvelous things. But don't believe everything these people say. Check it out. Do a careful study. So which Enoch are they talking about? Are they talking about the Enoch that walked with God? Or are they talking about the Enoch, the son of Cain? Well, we can find out. Enoch's son of Jared descended from Abe Adam via the line of Seth. So it's a different line. And he's called in the Bible the seventh generation from Adam. And if we use the chronology from Asher that even the spirit of prophecy used, then Enoch would have been born in the year 3382 BC. That's now the Enoch that walked with God. Pike's book is dated Masonically and it's dated by Christian Reckoning. This is fascinating stuff. It has two dates. One is the Masonic date and one is the Christian date. And the Reckoning in Pike's book to Enoch is given as the year 5860 AM. And if you look that up, it means Anu Mundi, the year of the world. So when did the world as we know it begin and when did this unbroken line of succession come down the line of history all the way to modern Freemasonry? According to Pike, it all started in the year 5860 Anno Mundi, year of the world. But it also has the normal date in it and it says the book came, was written in 1871 AD. All right, so if I want to find out if 5860 Anno Mundi is the same as 1870 AD, then when was it BC? Well, then you have to subtract the one from the other, 5860 minus 1871 to get a BC date from an AD date. You get to the year 3809. BC. So the Masonic calendar starts in 3809 BC. And that is 427 years 
before the Enoch that walked with God. So the dates in the very high occult writings tell us that the Enoch that they refer to is which one? The Enoch of Cain. So this unbroken line of authority comes all the way from Cain. Now let's read The Secret Doctrine by Blavatsky. Because in the esoteric world, everything is turned around. Good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Let's just check this out once more. Once that the key to Genesis is in our hands, it is the scientific symbolical Kabbalah which un unveils the secret. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical. And so are Jehovah and Cain one. So Cain is the God of this world who gave his power to rule to his son and he dedicated a city to him and he said there. Now a city also stands for a government, doesn't it? Isn't Babylon called a city? Yes or no? So if Babylon is called a city and Enoch got the power to rule over the city and the Lord God is the same as Cain, then it means that Cain gave his power to rule to his son Enoch. And the mark of Cain was transferred, the power and authority to rule was transferred from Cain to Enoch and then in an unbroken line all the way through to the modern world according to them. That Cain, who is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God, Jehovah tempts the king of Israel to number the people and Satan tempts him to do the same in another place. Jehovah turns into the fiery serpent to bite those he is displeased with and Jehovah informs the brazen serpent that heals them. These short and seemingly contradictory statements in the Old Testament, contradictory because the two powers are separated instead of being regarded as the two faces of one and the same thing, are the secret doctrine. So good is evil, evil is good. The Lord God is really Cain. So in that sense, Anu would be Cain. He's also the son of Ea, the moon goddess. Fascinating. Ea, Eve. And so there's an element of truth in these old legends. The appellation Satan in Hebrew, Satan, an adversary, from the word Shatana, to be adverse, belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all the other gods, Jehovah. This is the secret doctrine. Not to the serpent who spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom and is the worst even in the dogma of the ad adversary of men. So the enemy is who? The enemy is God. So in the line of Cain, the true God is the enemy. In the line of Cain, the true God is the enemy. And if there is a godly person like Abel, if it is within his power, what will he do to him? He'll kill him. He'll kill him. That's his mindset. He wants to rule. He has the power to rule. He has an authority to rule. He can punish sevenfold, 70 times sevenfold. He can put you into jail and into misery for whatever and keep you there until you rot. He has the power to do it. And he hates the God of heaven. That's his mindset. Now deception, of course, is something that comes into play as well because many who are subject to the rule of the Cain stream, don't even know that they are part of the Cain stream. And so they are deceived into following this rule, whether they like it or not. Therefore Jehovah was called by the Gnostics, the creator of and one with Ophiomorphos, the serpent or Satan. So you have a reversal, a gospel reversal. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. Now evil starts increasing on this planet. Cain rules with ruthlessness through his line. And by the time you get to Lamech, it is chaos and oppressive power. You mess with me, 
and my authority, I will sort you out. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So as I've said before, God's beautiful children go to do shopping in the mall, and there they see the daughters of men with their short little skirts and their tantalizing little ways. And before you know it, they intermarry. And the Lord says he will not strive with them forever. Your time shall be 120 years. And there were giants, Nephilim, apostates, not angelic people. That's wishful thinking on their part. No, there were apostates, Nephilim on the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God, the line of the children of Adam through the line of Seth, came unto the daughters of men and bare children to him, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So you had men who received great honor in the media. When you looked at the television set, the antediluvian set, you saw all the men of great valor and all the rulers, and they were the great philanthropists of the world, the powerful rulers, the presidents, the ones who were making the speeches. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And so when the 70 times 7 was full, he said probation for the antediluvian world is over. And he destroys them, except one family. Of course, Noah's family was all perfect, right? No, I think uh, there might have been some daughters there that were married to them. Who knows whether they were daughters of men or daughters of God. And perhaps the line of Cain came along with a ship. And the theology of Cain was in the ship. God is gracious, isn't he? God is gracious. Do we have a parallel anywhere else? Sodom and Gomorrah? Were they all perfect that were saved there? Or do we have Moabites and <laughs> Ammonites as a consequence? So the post-flood apostasy and the rule of Cain resumed then through the lineage of Ham. So the line wasn't actually broken. The apostasy, the great oppression, the great evil was arrested for a while. But it didn't take long before it flourished on the planet again. And finally, we come to the descendants of Ham, and we come to Nimrod. And Flavius Josephus writes of Nimrod. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of one of Noah's most wicked son, Ham. Therefore, great-grandson of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand, he persuaded his people not to ascribe their joys to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. Do we have that same philosophy today? He also gradually changed the government into a tyranny. He had the same mindset. He had the same mindset seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them in constant dependence on his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, and for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Enmity towards God, enmity to anyone who opposes him in this issue, and he begins to rule. He is the legitimate heir, then, of the power to rule over the children of evil. Well, masonry actually, in its writings, says that the Tower of Babel was their enterprise. 
So if morals and dogma traces it back to Enoch, then other writers trace it back to Nimrod. But it's the same thing. The one just takes the post-flood reoccurrence and the other one takes it from the pre-flood. And so the Tower of Babel is depicted as a Masonic enterprise. Arthur Edward Waite, as regards masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise. It is well known that the Tower of Babel is one of the most ancient traditions of masonry. So they don't make any bones about it. In the Masonic quiz book, the question is asked, who was Nimrod? The answer was, he was the son of Cush, and the old constitution referred to as one of the founders of masonry. And in the scripture, as the architect of many cities, was Enoch an architect of cities? So here you have city dwellers and country mouse. <laughs> All right, we find at the making of the Tower of Babel, there was masonry, first much esteemed of, and Nimrod was a mason himself and loved well masons. These are Masonic sources. Now, as we go down through history, we come to the various ruling powers, the superpowers of Earth that held sway. And we will find some parallels in all of them. They all received the same power to rule over the children of disobedience, those who chose their own way to worship God. If we go down in time to the history to the history of the Egyptians, Tutmosis III, he's the one who said, who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice. He was the Napoleon of Egypt. He was the great lawmaker. Nobody stood in his way, or he would destroy them. And he made an anti-Sabbath law, as you will remember, when he said, you will not rest, you will not Shabbat, you will not keep the Sabbath, you will not rest, but you will get unto your burdens. And when he made laws which counted God's law, his authority was judged at an end by God. So who permitted him to rule until he overstepped the mark? God. God permitted him to rule. Did God permit the king of Egypt to even be the authority in terms of government procedures over his own children, yes or no? Yes. Were they subject to the rules of Egypt? Yes. Did he have the power to even enslave them? Yes or no? Yes. Did he have the power to oppress them? The Bible says they were sorely oppressed. But there was a limit. 70 times 7. When your probation close, closes, you will be eradicated. So let's go away from Egypt and let's go to the Assyrians. This is history, grisly Assyrian record of torture and death. Assyrian national history as it has been preserved for us in the inscriptions and pictures consists almost solely of military campaigns and battles. When you look at the news today, do you see military campaigns and battles, yes or no? So it seems as if the, this line of power that rules over the children of disobedience has military might and military power and exercises that power even over the children of God. Is that right? Assyria emerged as a territorial state in the 14th century BC. Its territory covered approximately the northern part of modern Iraq. The first capital of Assyria was Assur located about 150 miles north of the modern Baghdad. And there on the left is a relief of Assyrian torture. They would rip the skins of people off their bodies while they were alive. The Bible tells us that they took Manasseh with hooks through his nose and dragged him to Babylon. He must have had one painful nose. On the west coast of the Tigris River, the city was named for its national god Assur, from which the name Assyria is also derived. From the outside, Assyria projected itself as a strong military power bent on conquest. 
Countries and people that opposed Syrian rule were punished by the destruction of their cities and the devastation of their fields and orchards. In the 9th century, Assyria had consolidated hegemony over the northern Mesopotamia. It was then that the Assyrian armies marched beyond their own borders to expand their empire, seeking booty to finance their plans for still more conquest and power. By the mid-19th century, the Assyrian menace posed a direct threat to the small Syro-Palestine states to the west, including Israel and Judah. So do they eventually try to take over God's people as well? Yes. And they have the line of authority because they are children of disobedience. And these are reliefs where we find the Assyrian armies. Here are the heads of the decapitated people that they decapitated. Here they are, the people are strung up on poles with spears all the way through them. The cruelest tortures that you can imagine. And people were scared of these rulers. If Cain shall be avenged seven times, Lamech seventy times seven times, if you don't fall subject to us, we'll show you what power we have. And we have authority. We have it directly by permission of God. Let's go to Roman law. By this time, the governments of the world have consolidated a legal system which is second to none. There's a law for every single transgression you can think of. There are penalties for moral deeds which are just indescribable and permissions for immorality which are equally indescribable. Does it ring a bell? And how did they deal with dissenters in the Roman Empire? Well, you were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. You were crucified on a cross. You were eaten alive by animals. You were whipped with whips until your entrails hung out. The cruelty was just indescribable. And their aggression did their aggression turn against God's people, yes or no? Yes, it did. But they ruled, and they had power to rule. Now let's have a look at one man who lived at that time, and his name was Herod the Great. He has been described as a madman who murdered his own family and a great many rabbis. If he murdered a great many rabbis, then did he have power to do so even over God's people, yes or no? Yeah. Must have had. The evil genius of the Judean nation prepared to commit any crime in order to gratify his unbounded ambition. Any crime. And the greatest builder in Jewish history is known for his colossal building projects. Does this ring a bell, Enoch? Does this ring a bell, Nimrod, the great builders? So they love their cities. They love their great monumental buildings. He's known for colossal building projects throughout Judea, including his expansion of the second temple in Jerusalem. Now, excuse me. This man is a cruel, cruel ruler who has power to rule, God's people are even subject to him. And he's building a temple for the worship of Yahweh. The construction of the port at and Masada and Rhodium and all of these. And uh, he was a powerful man. The Herodian dynasty was a Judean dynasty of Edomite. Edomian descent. Herodian dynasty began with Herod the Great who assumed the throne of Judea. So he ruled over God's people with Roman support and bringing down the century-long Hasmonean kingdom. His kingdom lasted until his death in 4 BCE when it was divided between his sons as Tetrarchy, which lasted about 10 years. Most of those kingdoms, including Judea, were incorporated into the provinces, etc., etc. 
These Judaized Edomites were not considered Jewish by the dominant Pharisaic tradition. So even though Herod may have considered himself of the Jewish faith, he was not considered Jewish by the observant and national Jews of Judea. Could we say today that there are some people who consider themselves of the Christian faith, but those who believe in the law of God and the Torah do not really consider them of the same level of knowledge in terms of Christianity, yes or no? Is that possible? Now, Herod was a loyal supporter of Hyrcanus II. Antipater appointed Herod governor of Galilee at 25 and his elder brother governor of Jerusalem, and he enjoyed the backing of Rome. But his brutality was condemned by the Sanhedrin. He was brutal. He was a ruthless man. Two years later, Antigonus, nephew, took the throne from his uncle with the help of the Parthians, and Herod fled to Rome. And there he did some pleading with his Roman rulers to restore him to power. And there he was elected by the Roman Senate, king of the Jews. Now here was the king of the Jews. And uh, Josephus and the encyclopedias are the sources. And Romans 9.13 says, As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, does God hate people? Of course not. So what did God hate? He hated the mindset of Enoch. He hated the mindset of Enoch. And here was a man who claimed to be ruler over God's people, but he had the mindset of Enoch. And God hates that mindset. Did God permit him to rule? Yes. He permitted him to rule. His first leadership role was as governor of Galilee, a position granted to him by his father, Antipater. Early on, Herod demonstrated his brutality by ruthlessly crushing a revolt in Galilee. Later, during the Parthian incursion, he flees, makes his way to Rome, where he impresses Mark Antony, and with his help, persuades the Roman senators to name him king of the Jews so he can return and bring Judea back under Roman control. And after three years of fighting, he takes the throne and he is officially king of the Jews. Can you see why he's upset when suddenly there's a rumor there's another king of the Jews? Matthew 2, verse 18, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted, for they are not. So he murders the little children in order to get rid of Christ, but he underestimates God. Does he persecute God's people? Yes. Does he hate this kind of opposition, godly opposition? Absolutely. Whose mindset does he have? He has the mindset of Cain. He has the mindset of Cain. He has the same power to rule. Who does he get his power from? Who lends him that power, gives him his title? Rome. Rome gave him his power, gave him his title. You're the king of the Jews. And so he built a temple. I'm the king of the Jews. I'll build a temple. And he builds a temple. But Herod saw fit, however, to place at the main entrance a huge Roman eagle. Who does he dedicate the temple to? Not to the God of the universe. He dedicates the temple, which stands for worship. He dedicates it to Rome. This is history. And the pious Jews saw this as sacrilege, as well they should. Here it was in symbols. Take it in antitype. Can we see God's worship dedicated to Rome today, yes or no? Wouldn't the pious Christians see that as sacrilege, yes or no? Okay. Two teachers and a group of Torah students smashed this emblem of idolatry and oppression, but Herod had them hunted down and dragged in chains to his residence in Jericho, where they were burned alive. 
Do you see his mindset? Do you know of Christians that were later burned alive because they had a different mindset to Rome? Thus, having built the temple, Herod took pains to make sure it would be run without future problems of this kind. You will worship your God according to my dictates. He pointed his own high priest, having by then put to death 46 leading members of the Sanhedrin, the rabbinical court. So by the time Jesus actually starts preaching, the good guys are all dead already. <laughs> They've been put to sleep. Herod's cruelty was legendary. I'm talking about the Herodian mind. But it's not isolated to Herod. It is a historic mindset that comes all the way from the Garden of Eden and runs with an unbroken chain all the way through history and to our present day. And we have to find the current custodians of this Herodian mindset. Now, I chose Herod. I could have said the mind of Cain. But I find in Herod the culmination of history because it is Herod, or his son, who was also a Herod, who even crucified the Prince of Peace. So this mindset, this enmity towards God's people, coupled with the power to exercise it under official authority, is mind-boggling because initially God granted Cain the mark of Cain, the authority to rule. And he established an enormous secret police force. I want you to look at history and let the bells start ringing. Brutally killed anyone suspected of plotting against him and created Roman peace by slaughtering all dissidents. We will have military intervention if you don't do as we say. Herod Antipas, the mindset continues. You remember the story of Herod, Herodias and Salome? I don't want to go into that typology, I've done it before. But the head of John the Baptist gave it to me. Now, fortunately, in our typology, this was a type of the Elijah, but there was also an Elijah that was translated without seeing death. So we will see. Some of us might end up being John the Baptist typologically, and some of us might end up, hopefully, being the other one, the one who did not see death. And this is Jesus before Herod Antipas. Can you imagine the king and the prince of the universe being arrayed before this earthly monarch who is sitting there by whose authority? God's authority. He has been permitted to rule. Because God, in his mercy, doesn't want anyone to be lost. Now I want to ask you a question. Did God give Herod Antipas every single possible opportunity to repent? Yes or no? What does that tell you about the character of God? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Believable. And I want you to cast your mind back in history. The Babylonian Empire, where Nebuchadnezzar set up a system which was just the same as Herod's. Nebuchadnezzar had a secret police second to none. He knew everything that was happening in his kingdom. He was unbelievably cruel. If you crossed him, you ended up in the fiery furnace, alive, throw you in there. I don't care if my soldiers die in the process. Who was a cruel man. He set up a counterfeit system of religion. Did God give him every opportunity to repent? Yes or no? Will he be in heaven? Yes. 
the Assyrians. If you go down in history, you come to Nineveh. Was there a ruler who repented at the preaching of Jonah? One of the cruelest of all rulers. I think his name was not Naari III. And all of a sudden, all history of his cruelty ceases, and there's no more war and total peace in his kingdom. Does God care about these rulers? Yes. And here he is arrayed before him. He gets a final opportunity. He sees the Prince of Peace. He sees those eyes. He sees them personally. And he has him mocked. And they put a reed in his hand. And they put a crown of thorns on his head. And they beat him over the head over and over and over again and say, prophesy who beat you over the head. This is the mind of Herod. It is a mind that has separated itself from God, but it has power to rule. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. If there is one thing that unites even the warring factions of the children of Cain, it's a common enemy. And if that common enemy is still the Prince of Peace or his followers, so much the better, because Cain slew Abel. And that animosity towards the truth is part and parcel of those who have the mark of Cain, all the way through. Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which, was, woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour a child as soon as it was born. Herod the first, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and a child was caught up unto God and to his throne." Here's the true ruler. His law is a law of justice and mercy. The other ruler also rules with a rod of iron, but he rules with a mark of Cain. And the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. Acts 4, 26. For of the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. That's scary. That's scary. My question is the following. Can this mark of Cain even progress to within God's people itself? Men and children, brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So what is the criterion of these rulers? They knew him not. And they didn't know the prophecies either. They didn't know him. And they didn't know the prophecies. Should God's people know him and the prophecies, yes or no? Okay. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He wasn't satisfied with killing the prince of peace and handing, over, handing him over, beaten to Pilate. No, no, he stretched his hand out towards the church because the mindset of Cain is slay Abel. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know for a surety that the Lord has sent his angel, because he imprisoned even Peter. I jumped a few verses there. And delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Will there be persecution? Yes or no? Yes. Who is our only deliverer and our only hope in that persecution? Jesus. And I want you to remember that because we're going to go into very fine detail here. And we prayed that the eyes of this church and of the world will be opened. 
And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. Ooh, how, do we hear things like that? Someone today just from that little balcony opens his mouth and says, Cheap. They say, Oh, it's the voice of a God. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not glory to the Lord and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. There comes a time when the 70 times 7 is up and probation stops for the rulers who rule under the power of the mark of authority given by God to Cain to rule over the children of evil. I exhort therefore that first of all supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Do you understand that verse a little bit better? We must pray that God will curtail them in their animosity towards God's people so that the work of God can continue that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour. God has handed over the children of evil to the rules of evil. You know, my wife gave classes, she was a school teacher, in a very, very, very depressed, unruly, very disenfranchised school. And the children were incredibly unruly and violent. They had strangled a teacher. They had stabbed another teacher. The police were afraid to break up the gang fights in the school. And she taught in that school. Now my wife is a timid lady and her authority counted for naught. And so one day she said to them, all right, you don't want to listen to my rules? Then you make the rules. And they said, okay. And they started making the rules. If you do this, then that happens to you. If you do this, and they made a long list of rules. The most draconian rules that you can imagine. Like if you chew gum or something, you will sweep the whole school with a toothbrush on your knees until the skin comes off. Rules like that. And they stuck to their rules. And there was harmony in the class. So when she couldn't rule over them, she handed them over to the mark of Cain and said, rule over the children of evil. And they said, we will increase the rules sevenfold. Nay, 70 times 70. <laughs> Is that, I thought that was a good example. And that's exactly what God did. He said, okay, you don't want to accept my authority? I'll hand you over to that authority. And behind that authority stands another authority. He's called the dragon. And he's blowing his evil breath upon them. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou, thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And it works like that. If you do good, people despise you, but eventually they sort of respect you, especially when you're dead. Isn't that so? Yes, go and look at the monuments of all the great men that were hated and respected after their death. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So we are not in a perfect situation. God has given them the power to rule. We are subject to that rule, just like the children of Israel were subject to Pharaoh. There's nothing we can do about it, but we can pray. We can pray for them. And we can obey the rules of the land as far as they do not come into conflict with God's law. And then we must rely on God. That's the situation we are in. Now this is Shamsi Adat, 823, 811 BC. So here you have one of these great Syrian rulers. And notice what he has around his neck. 
And he is one of those powerful rulers, and there is the symbol of Anu, also the star of Ishtar. So there's a male deity and there's a female deity. And he has authority. Whose authority does he have and under whose mark does he rule? Under the mark of Cain. Now, we studied the, the esoteric writings and we saw where that led to, so let's go back to them. This is again morals and dogma. The degree rose, and then he uses the symbol. Is that the same symbol that uh, you saw on the Assyrian king? Yes. Teaches three things. The unity, immutability, and goodness of God. So there's an element of religion here. The immortality of the soul. Is it the true God or false God? It's a false God. And the ultimate defeat and extinction of evil and wrong and sorrow by a Redeemer or Messiah yet to come if he has not already appeared. Excuse me. Is this the same Messiah we're waiting for? No. So here is a religion, but it's not the religion of God. It's another religion. And it's a false religion. But this degree, the rose, uses this as its sign. And here are the symbols of the Rosicrucians. They use the phoenix rising out of the ashes, and they use the symbol of the pelican feeding its young. Now, without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption, and the lamb had to die in order to symbolize the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Here is a sacrifice which is made to feed the children, but the creature does not die. So it's a false religion. It's a false religion. And this was the symbol that was used at the last Olympics in London, where the phoenix rises out of the ashes. So the rulers of the world used the symbol that is used in the Rosicrucian symbolism. So the current rulers of the world haven't suddenly changed. They haven't suddenly become God's people. If you go to Roman Catholicism, you find both of these emblems in the Roman Catholic Church. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat, and what? Great authority. Who, according to the scripture, wields the authority today? The beast. The beast. Now, every reformer said that this was Roman Catholicism. There's no doubt about it that this was Roman Catholicism. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. That was the President of the United States who handed over the financial power of the United States to the Federal Reserve. Fascinating. Liberty has never come from the government. This is the President of the United States speaking. Liberty has always come from the subjects of the government. The history of liberty is a history of resistance. The history of liberty is a history of the limitation of governmental power, not the increase of it. So when governmental power increases, they are exercising an authority. And it's an authority that comes all the way down from the line of Enoch. Here we have the Rosicrucians who use the very symbol, there it is, that we found on the Assyrian kings. And they are subject to the Roman sea. And today we have two popes ruling, although one sits on the throne, and both of them have these powers under their control. And here is the current general of the Jesuits, Adolfo Nicolas. And he rules over forces that we will see 
are all-encompassing. Now let's go to the great controversy. I specifically chose the great controversy because isn't this a project of this church? Just checking. <laughs> Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. Protestantism was menaced. The first triumph of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. Now, please note, I'm not saying this. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. The most cruel. Cut off from every earthly tie and human interest, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order. And no duty was to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet a danger enduring suffering undismayed by cold hunger and toil poverty to uphold the banner of truth in the face of the rack, the dungeon and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume, vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. It was this studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the re-establishment of the papal supremacy. That's from the pen of inspiration. The Inquisition Inquisition was unscrupulous. It was cruel. Now the Jesuits were given the Inquisition in Rome, not to be confused with the Spanish Inquisition, which was run by the Dominicans. But in Rome, the Jesuits, at the heart of power, they were the Inquisitors. The tools they used for torture were horrendous. This thing was put around your neck and that screw tightened until your larynx gave way and you died. And it was used as recently as in the Franco Wars in Spain. They used the thumb screws. They tied people to a, a hoist and tied a heavy ball and then dropped it down so that their limbs would be ripped from their bodies. They burned people at the stake. The most incredible tortures. These are drawings and pictures of actual events that took place. This is how they tied them up and then they dropped that ball. They were so cruel, it is unbelievable. And the spirit of prophecy says these were the champions. And here you have the present black pope and the present white pope. And today we have some unprecedented history. We have two current popes. And we have, for the first time in history, two black popes. Because not only Ratzinger retired, but Peter Hans Kolvenbach also retired for the first time in history. Is the work so great that they have to divide the world into two parts? And they are at the disposal of this mighty machine. Here is the present Pope in the company of the Jesuits, because the first thing when a Pope is elected is he meets with the Jesuit generals and his highest authorities. Adolfo Nicolas, the black pope, and Bergoglio, the white pope. They seem very happy about something. Very happy. Both of them are Jesuits. Christian example of Pope Francis provides a contrast with the graceless. But who would ever have believed his successor could be a Francis from the ends of the earth, a Jesuit, and also ran in the 2005 conclave? The poorest of the poor know the great surprise about Francis is that he's so Christian. He walks the walk, so many prelates he content to just talk the talk. He has showed the trappings of his office to live frugally in Buenos Aires. He took the bus. But to go and visit the Pope just next door, he took the helicopter. <laughs> and he was elected on the 13th of the 3rd, 2013. Add the numbers, it comes to 13. 
and the smoke appeared at five past eight, add the numbers, it comes to 13. And yesterday he went to Assisi and his departure time is exact and his return time is exact. He'll spend exactly 13 hours in Assisi. And his name is Francis. Is it Francis of Assisi? Or is it Francis Xavier, the co-founder of the Jesuit order, who ordered the Inquisition in Goa and proclaimed that all Sabbath keepers there should be destroyed? I am fascinated with this man. Here he is seen kissing the feet of prisoners. If you look carefully, he still wears his black robes under his white robe, as you can see over there. There's his symbol in the bus. I don't want to discuss that picture further. And let's read the great controversy. When appearing as members of the order, they were a go wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and to the poor. I'm reading from the great controversy professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good, but under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the mean. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the entrance of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, Climbing up to be the counselors of kings, shaping the policy of nations, they became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people and the children of Protestant parents were drawn into observance of popish rites. That's what the pen of inspiration tells us. Two swords. A medieval doctrine on the relation of church and state as explained by Pope Boniface VIII. We are taught by the word of the gospel that in this church and under her control there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. This is the Pope speaking. Both of these, the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. Who has the mark of authority? According to this, the church. Which church? Rome. The first is wielded by the church, the second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hands of the priests, the second by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and by the permission of the priests. Sword must be sub subordinate to sword and is only fitting that temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. This doctrine was not defined by the Pope, but reflected the mentality of the age when both priests and kings were members of the same Catholic Church in whose name Pope Boniface was speaking. Father John Hansen, Modern Catholic Dictionary. This is their writings. They control the sword. They wield the sword of authority. They have the mark of power. This is the Pope's Bull unam sanctum. We are informed by the text of the Gospel that in this church and in its power, are two swords, the spiritual and the temporary. For when the apostle says, behold, there are two swords, that is to say in the church, since the apostles were speaking, the Lord did not reply that there were too many, but sufficient. We'll talk about that text in a moment. Certainly the one who denies that the temporal sword is in the power of Peter has not listened well to the word of the Lord commanding, put up thy sword unto thy scabbard. Both therefore are in the power of the church. That is to say, the spiritual and the material sword. But the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church. The former in the hand of the priest, the latter in the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. Who controls? The church. However, one sword ought to be subordinate to the other, and temporal authority subjected to spiritual power. For since the Apostle said there is no power except from God, and the things that are are ordained of God, Romans 13, 1 and 2, but they would not be ordained if one sword were not subordinate to the other. 
And if the inferior one, inferior one, as it were, were not laid upwards by the other, furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Now, I didn't take this from some obscure source. I made sure I took it directly from the Vatican webpage. So check it out there for yourselves. Now, let's look at this text. Luke twenty-two thirty-five. And here, this is Jesus speaking. How this text has been distorted is amazing. And he said to them, Whence I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lack ye anything? And they said, nothing. Okay, let's just get one thing clear. God's people, how did he send them out? Without scrip, without purse, right? Now he's saying, then said he unto them, But now he that has a purse, how were they sent out? Help me. Without purse. So now he's referring to another class. Those that have the purse. Those that have the power over the economy. Those that have the power over the sword. But now he that has a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. That's his knapsack. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. This is war. This is war. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned amongst the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. What did Jesus say to them? Jesus said to them, my dear disciples, I don't think you understood what I just said. I said to you, I sent you out without purse. But there's another class that has the purse and that has the sword. And I, the Son of Man, will now be handed over to them. And they will use that authority and they will crucify me. But they didn't understand, so they said, but Lord, look, we've got two swords. And Jesus says, oh, please, I'm not talking about your stupid little sword. It's enough. He's talking about those who wield the authority, those who have the mark of Cain, who are going to kill him. It's not the church that must wield the sword. It is those who rule over the children of evil. Thomas Aquinas said, the Pope by divine right has spiritual and temporal power as supreme king of the world. He is the king. The Pope of Rome, as the head of the papal government, claims absolute sovereignty and supremacy over all the governments of the earth. That is their saying. The right of deposing kings is inherent in the supreme sovereignty of the popes as vice-regent of Christ exercises over all Christian nations. This is what they claim. And whose sign do we see there? We see the sign of Anu, the very one that Maduk wore, the one that emphasizes the power. Now we'll follow it a little bit, but we will do that in the next episode. I'm sure we all need a short break. So let's take a short break and come back for the second half. <laughs>